Hey, welcome to our show. I'm your host, Tyler Coe, and I'm excited to have you here, no matter how you got here. We do our show live on Twitch every single week, and you can also watch recorded versions on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, and iTunes, and I think a few others. All links are in the description below, and as always, please subscribe. And with that, let's start the show. How are we today, everyone? I'm your host, Tyler Go, And today on the show, we have some amazing guests. Uh, we are going to get to the homework that we had last week, and I have a new assignment for you guys. Um, but first, we need to celebrate this. Today is the 31st anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was a massive deal. It prohibits discrimination uh, based on disability, race, religion, sexual orientation, pretty much everything. And... You know, Mental Health America, which is a really good organization, had a good post on Instagram today reminding people that if you live with a mental illness, you qualify. You are entitled to psychiatric uh, disability accommodations in your school, in your work, thanks to this passage, uh, thanks to the passage of this act. And, you know, it's, it's because of organizations like Mental Health America, along with so many others, which... By the way, we're going to have one on today that I'm very excited about, um, that we can have effective change in the world, that people can band together to, you know, shape and power the future that we want, which is so important. In fact, the founder of Mental Health America is a guy named Clifford Beers, guys, Clifford Whittingham Beers. That is the dopest name ever. Uh, and Beers was considered the founder of the mental hygiene movement here in America. And one of his lasting impacts, among many, but were his famous words when he uh, was facing naysayers and skeptics about his movement uh, and his fight against stigmas and fears surrounding mental health. He said, I must fight in the open, which is such an encouraging thing to hear. And I know so many of you watching or listening uh, are already a part of that fight and affecting change when it comes to mental health. And for those of you that are not, but you're wanting to get involved and trying to figure out where to start, uh, it doesn't matter where you are on the battlefield. Today's episode is about you. So today's episode, here you go, Rebecca. Today's episode is about how do I get involved? There we go. Wrote on the chalkboard. I'm so happy about that. Um, so here's the deal, guys. Um, for our very first special guest, uh, I, I'm so honored that this person is going to be on our show today. Um, they are from NAMI. Um, now, NAMI is a... Um, NAMI is a, a wonderful organization which stands for the National Alliance on Mental Health. Uh, NAMI is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization that really started off as a small group of families sitting around the kitchen table in 1979, and it's now turned into the leading voice in America when it comes to mental health. Um, they're an alliance of over 600 affiliates. Um, we're about to speak to one of the uh, affiliates right now, and they're in 48 states here in the United States. Um, so. I actually, <laughs> this happens, guys. Um, I'm trying to see where my friend went. I don't see her yet. She wasn't, wait, she's coming on right now. Hold on, she's about to be here. Uh, we're going to get her off mute, and I'm going to introduce you to the executive director of NAMI Central Texas, Karen Reynas. Karen, how hey are you there. today? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us on today's show. Um, I want to make sure, though, guys, that we can hear. Can we hear Karen okay, everybody? I think we can. So, Karen, how are we today? How are we feeling? I'm feeling pretty good today for a Monday, sort yeah. of with the crowd earlier. It felt like a really good uh, way to start the week, and uh, so I'm feeling good. That's good to How hear. How about you? I'm, well, I'm excited uh, that you decided yeah. to come on this program. And, and folks, I want to let you know, 
uh, Karen was a huge driving force in uh, making this show possible. Um, she has opened up NAMI to us uh, to have people uh, appear on the show who want to appear on the show. And she's also getting me involved in volunteering. So Karen, I mean, just from that standpoint alone, you're changing my life already. And it's funny how these things go because you and I met for like a quick, like it was coffee. We never met each other. And it was like, Anna, you know, we don't know what to expect. And it was going to be, you know, like 10, 15 minutes. I feel like it was like two and a half hours later, we had to tell ourselves to stop talking. <laughs> I was shocked when I got in my car and saw what time it was. <laughs> we spent the whole day doing it. And I know we could we could do that all day, but I want to kind of get right to it. So, Karen, um, you know, obviously I was so inspired uh, by your origin story, if you will. And I would just love for you to kind of share that with our audience about your journey, what led you to NAMI and, and why you were still there. Yeah, you know, and I love that you're starting with the story because I'm just such a believer that uh, storytelling is one of the ways we really break down some of the barriers of stigma and shame when it comes to mental health. And the wonderful thing about stories is we're just all people of storytelling. Like we're all rooted in that. So everybody loves a story. And so my story in terms of my journey with NAMI really started a little over 10 years ago. In fact, in January, it was 10 years that I almost lost my then 18 year old daughter to suicide. And she was um, a college freshman at that time. And I just got that call that no parent ever wants to receive. And um, like it is for many families, it just completely discombobulated us. And I found myself like a lot of parents do in this place of getting stuck in, in the shame. And, um, and I wanna be clear that the shame was not with my daughter. It was really my own shame of feeling like, obviously, if my daughter is in a psychiatric hospital, then I failed. Like I failed as a parent and there's something wrong with me. And I can remember literally sitting in the waiting room of the psychiatric hospital, like making that mental list of everything that I'd obviously done or failed to do. And that's why we were in the place that we were in. And that's why my daughter was in this horrible situation. And I was just beating myself up. And honestly, I probably kept beating myself up until I found NAMI. And I'm basically one of those moms that Stuff like this happens and I just try to inform and educate myself. So I started looking for resources because the reality is no one really provides them for you. I mean, it wasn't, you know, we met with a social worker there at the hospital, but no one said, hey, here's a book you can read or here's, you know, an organization that might help you. And so I just started doing the research myself and I stumbled across NAMI. So this was back in 2011. And um, it just so happens that when I reached out, it was like late in the spring, maybe it was like May or so. And they were having people sign up for their next class, which was scheduled for to start in June. And it was a 12 week course at that time. Now it's eight weeks long. And I just, I thought, this is it. I, I've got to do this. And so I signed up and um, found myself taking those 12 weeks. Uh, my husband opted not to go. He was just like, I don't think I can sit in a room and talk about this. But he said, you go, I'll take care of the kids and you just go and see what you can learn. And so it was Tuesday nights. So every Tuesday night I would come home with this binder that they gave me and with the information that we'd covered that evening. And I would just come home and I'd be like, listen to this, guys. And so really, I think that was when the transformation for us started to happen like I often say, there was this cloud of shame that was hanging over us. And then we found NAMI and suddenly it was like, oh, wait, we don't have any reason to be ashamed or embarrassed. This is a health issue and it's difficult to treat. And the experiences we're having are the same experiences that lots of families and lots of individuals have. And it just completely changed that. And I cannot begin to tell you, so I'm this big believer of us really naming the shame part. I think we talk a lot about stigma and we throw that word around a lot, but I think it's important to recognize that stigma manifests itself as shame for people. And when we feel shame, it's toxic and it makes us shut down and it makes us hunker down and isolate. And so once we were probably like three weeks into that 12 weeks, I mean, it just really completely transformed us. And I found myself starting to share our story with people. Up until then, when I would encounter people and they'd say, hey, how's Sarah doing? I'd be like, oh, 
she's fine, you know, and, and I would just walk away. <laughs> like, I just wouldn't engage in the conversation. And so now as people were starting to say, hey, what's Sarah doing? Oblivious to what was going on. I started telling people. And you know what I discovered? That when I would start telling that story, inevitably, every single time, that person would say to me, oh my gosh, me too. And they would share their own story of a father or a daughter or a son or a spouse or any number of situations. And then they'd say, and where did you, what, what class did you take? Where did you go? And um, it was just, like I said, transformative. And I took the class and they actually, um, at the end of the class, we're trying to recruit people. And I said, man, I would love to get involved. It's just not the right time for me. Like, I was just starting to get my bearings and trying to get a handle on work and kids and everything else. And I said, but I promise you I'll circle back. So the job where I was working, I was working at a nonprofit that dealt with supportive housing for women and children who'd been homeless. And I um, was posting a job one day for the organization where I worked. And um, I saw that they were hiring and I knew that it was their first professional hire. So I reached out to the board president who had taught my class because every class is taught by a family member who has their own experience of having a family member who has a mental health condition. And I just said, hey, congratulations. I know this is a really big deal. And she re immediately responded and said, it is a really big deal. And if you know of anyone, like, let us know, because we're really, you know, we're trying to find the right person. So I just kept thinking about it. And I finally mentioned it to my husband. And then he said, so what are you telling me? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and then I mentioned it again a few days later. And he's like, what are you telling me? And I said, I don't, I don't know. I, I just, I can't seem to forget about this job. He said, well, why don't you apply? And I said, I don't know. I have a lot of questions. He goes, okay, we'll just apply. And then you can get your questions answered. And he literally one Saturday morning said, I'm going grocery shopping. You have to sit here and you cannot leave the house until you have written that cover letter and gotten everything in because I just know you're going to regret it if you don't. And who would have known, like, I'm so grateful for him because I sent in my application and um, resume and all that stuff. And about a week later, they reached out and I became their first program manager. And they hired me with the intent of my being their first executive director. And here I am now, eight years later, and it has been an amazing journey. One that I would have never imagined. I mean, there's so many lessons in that, what you just talked about that I know that our viewers are going to get, especially when you have reinforcements and you kind of sit with an emotion and kind of like you talked about with like, I don't know what this is. I don't know. Am I going to do this? You feel yourself like leaning forward. Um, I felt that way with this show too of like, is this what I'm going to do? Yep, it is what I'm going to do. It sits in the brain. Um, and then your story, while it's heartbreaking, I know there's redemption there. And, and you guys are closer as a family for doing that. And that's, you know, at least in my volunteer training right now, that's uh, such a common story. And um, it, it's something that we all really need to pay attention to. I, the first volunteer training I did, I think there was only three mentally um, ill people in the group. Oddly enough, they were all bipolar, including myself, but the rest were my, my brother, my mom, my grandmother. They're going through it. I need to know under, and, and understand what's, what's happening. Um, I also thought what you mentioned, um, as far as kind of like those, those baby steps that we can kind of all take of, of, of making things okay. When it comes to shame, we were actually working on that on our first episode of being able to just sit with the feeling and shame was a big part of that and being able to road that away. And you're just a prime example of like, there's light there. If you can kind of get rid of it and whittle away at it, look at where you can go. Um, and it's just such an amazing story and I'm so glad that you shared it. And I think the next question I want to ask is that because you are the executive director now, Karen, um, you have a really good view from the top. And I think that's, that's such a treat for our audience is that getting somebody like you who has that perspective, um, I'd love to get your thoughts. And I know our audience would of, I'm a young teen, I'm a mom, I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a parent. Um, I'm somebody who just got diagnosed. I need to educate myself and maybe I need to get involved. For those different groups, where are good places to start? Yeah, and I love that because I do think that one of the gifts of getting involved is that so often when we are in those places of saying, I'm ready to get involved, it's often because we want to help other people. But I know in my own life, in my own experience, and with many of the volunteers that we have, 
that actually what happens is when we get involved in that way, we just we are flooded with the gifts of actively participating in this way. And so it's funny how we have a number of volunteers who we ask them, it's like, oh, you've been doing this for a while. Like, what keeps you going? It's like, I get so much out of it. So I think one of the best ways to get involved is really to figure out, I've often said that I think I'm a big believer in do what you love and love what you do. And I think that that's really important to a volunteer experience is that, um, you know, so often we try to find those places where it's like, oh, I have this skill set. So I'm going to get involved over here because this is what I know how to do. But I often say and encourage people to listen to their heart, because sometimes it's not necessarily the thing that maybe you professionally do that will interest you as a volunteer. Sometimes it's something else. Maybe you're an engineer for, you know, as part of your professional life, but you really love art. And so maybe that's what you need to do is get involved with an art organization. And I think mental health organizations are the same in that there's lots of different opportunities and lots of different organizations. And even within the organization, there's lots of different ways to get involved. And I think it's really finding that perfect fit where your skills and passions and interests line up nicely with the organization's needs as well. And so because I think volunteer experiences ought to be mutually benefiting, like the organization should benefit, but so should you. You should be having this really rich experience. So I think the first thing is really to just um, start researching and figuring out, like, what is it that you're interested in? I know when you and I had this conversation, you were just like, oh, my gosh, tell me more. And I was talking to you and I'm, and I'm thinking, wow, you're a great storyteller. And we have a number of programs that we do that it's essentially storytelling. Because as I said, we're a big believer that storytelling breaks down those barriers, right? And so I just said, let me connect you with a couple of folks because I really think that's the place to start. Um, you'll find that a lot of organizations do what we do, which is they have information sessions, which I think is a great sort of first place to start because they sort of give you an overview of all the possibilities. So then you can sort of listen and think, well, do any of these resonate with me? And let me figure out which ones do. And then I know our staff and staffs of many organizations are, you know, primed for then just having conversations with you and answering any additional questions that you have. And then at NAMI, the wonderful thing is we train you so that we're not going to put you in a situation where you're just walking in the door and have no experience. Um, we'll make sure and train you. And we also try to make sure that we're actually setting you up to partner with someone else whenever you're doing programming. We're a big believer. Almost every single program that we have, there's always two people that participate and either facilitate or teach or, you know, lead a support group um, because we really believe in the buddy system and in that power of being able to do things together. So I think the most important thing is to figure out what is it that's really calling you that you're interested in? And then finding that good match with the organization that you're interested in. And you can find out a lot about an organization by just looking at their website. Take a look at what they offer. Um, look at the language that they use. Take a look at their calendar and see what kinds of activities that they're having. And if you really feel like, hey, this might be a great fit for me, then take the next step. See where their information sessions are happening. Or maybe they have a, a site like we do, a page that's just for volunteers. And you can learn a lot more there as well. I love our website because it's sort of broken down into the different kinds of ways that you can get involved so that it's broken down really easily. Um, we try to make it as easy as possible for our team. And we're a big believer that volunteers are an extension of our team. And that's how we like to engage volunteers is really seeing them as partner with us in this really important work. I think um, that's kind of the thing that I was struck with when you talked to me about that. It really got me thinking about joining not only NAMI, but others is because, I mean, frankly, Karen, like, I'm sure a lot of people watching this or listening can relate. Like when I think of volunteering, I think of like wearing a dope shirt, like, you know, dopey shirt and like cleaning up trash or something like that, which aren't, that's not like, those aren't like bad things. Right. But you think of kind of like this boring, um, you know, monotonous type of thing. And then when you told me what NAMI does, I'm like, this sounds fun. And like, I'm not trying to like sell you guys right now, but it's like, I legitimately, I was like, I never knew that organizations could be like that. This stuff is really engaging. It's really exciting. I like what you have as far as like the events you do and like the walks and everything else. Like there really is so much that one person can do. And I think a lot of us sit there when it comes to volunteering, they, we sit there and we're like, cause I've always felt that way. Even when it comes to talking about my mental health, I'm like, what good would an organization like get from me? I think a lot of people feel that way, but it's it's comforting to hear that there really is a place for you no matter what. You just have to have the intent to want to help, and then you're in. 
Absolutely. And I don't ever want to diminish the value of someone who's willing to come in and take out the trash or do any of those things. <laughs> we need all kinds of things. We don't have a whole lot of that, but I'm thinking about my friend who's been volunteering at the food bank where they make the meals. And she was telling me, she texted me one day, she goes, okay, I'm volunteering and I have bean juice all over my shoes. Um, she says, but I'm loving it. And so, um, you know, every organization has different things that they're doing. And for us, as NAMI as an organization is all about education and support programming and advocacy. So our programs just have to be, have, happen to be set up so that it really is about engaging with people teaching people how to facilitate support groups, teaching them and training them how to teach a class, like the class that I took, um, teaching them and training them how to give presentations. And that was where I know we, I sort of, as I was listening to you tell your story, I thought was so powerful because a lot of the work we're doing right now is really about educating the larger community. So educating teens and their parents, um, educating faith leaders, um, today I was doing police training and we do that with right. um, volunteer presenters. I think I mentioned that to you. So I did do a training for law enforcement today where we bring in presenters who have had their own lived experience of having a mental illness and also having to engage with law enforcement. And our number one goal in those situations is really to just build more empathy and compassion and understanding. And nothing is more affirming to me and we find this at schools and other places where people tell their stories, then to have someone come up to you and say, thank you so much. I needed to hear that story. And it completely changed the way I see all of this. And with law enforcement, that's really important. We had an officer that came up and just said, you know, I needed to hear this because I only encounter people when they're at their worst, when they're really not well. And so I needed to see people who are well and, and be reminded that people can and do get better. And so um, that kind of feedback is so incredibly affirming and just makes you realize, again, the power of creating space for us to tell these really important stories. I can shoot all kinds of facts and figures at people, but it's the stories that really breaks down all of the walls and barriers that people have to being more empathetic and compassionate and understanding. And I said better myself. I mean, I've, I've started to experience that in just the past few years when I have opened up. I've had people stop me mid conversation when I tell them that I'm bipolar and they say, I just got diagnosed too. And they're just trying to figure it out. And I get so excited to kind of talk about it. Not excited that they have it, obviously, but excited to kind of share. And I'm starting to see the power of that. Um, so I'm so excited um, for our viewers to get this to hopefully get, even if we get one person today who goes and volunteers, that's a big W. Um, and Karen, I do know before we get, uh, get you out of here that, you know, it is something that I think it's also worth mentioning that it can be kind of difficult as well. Um, Cause I know that there are very hard days, especially with what we are talking about in the space that we are in together. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. Unfortunately, that some days are going to be really tough and, you're going to be talking about some pretty devastating things. I had a call like that this morning where it was a very heavy morning. So I want to know for you, Karen, as executive director um, and being in, every, being in it every day, you know, what is it that keeps you in the fight when the days get dark? What keeps you moving forward? Honestly, I often say my daughter is definitely my muse. Um, so that definitely, I think that passion of having a mother's heart and knowing what it's like to be in that position and she often inspires me, um, so definitely that. But I think the other thing, honestly, because our we're really fortunate. I mean, Sarah's in a great place. She lives with chronic depression and anxiety. That's a lifelong situation for her, but she is just doing fantastic, right? I mean, she's in such a great place in her life. And But I periodically am reminded as I get an opportunity to talk to family members, um, you know, a couple of moms are coming to mind right now who called me and I've had long conversations with them. And I am reminded that there is still so much work to do. And um, I often tell people when I encounter them, and, and as, as you pointed out, like not, not every story is this has a great ending. And for many people, they're in the middle of their story and it's di still difficult and challenging. And so I often say to folks, like, just know I carry that story with me. And it drives the passion for this important work that we're doing. And I think that's, again, going back to the stories and how important they can be, they can also be incredibly inspiring um, for all of us 
to want to do more, to be more engaged, to, to voice more the importance of us making as a culture, as a community, um, mental health a priority. You know, I think we talked about this, that one of my big soapbox I'd like to stand on is just this understanding that mental health is health. We have spent so many years separating them out and saying, well, that's physical health and this is mental health. And then sometimes we call mental health behavioral health, which I detest because it implies that if people would just behave, everything would be okay. So I think it's so important that we have to be a voice for change so that we can continue to move forward in regards to access to treatment, to insurance, to ensuring that none of us ever, that's my dream, that we get to this place where people get a diagnosis like bipolar disorder or, you know, um, anxiety or OCD, and there is no shame that it is just like getting a diagnosis for diabetes and you go, man, I, you know, you know that your life is going to change and you're going to have to watch what you eat and exercise and, and all of these other things are going to have to change, but you're not ashamed. And I want us to move in that direction. And it's going to take all of us. We all have to be having these conversations and being active in helping to change the conversation around mental health. Well, Karen, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation today with us. And thank you for sharing your story. Um, just thrilled to have you on and have everybody hear that. Um, and I hope that they can get involved. Uh, I'm gonna include a lot of information in our links, guys, about NAMI uh, and how to get involved. And I'm sure Karen will, can send me some links too to help me out with that. And uh, I know I probably put myself in the doghouse. I just told the boss, like, I don't wanna take out the trash. So I know that I'm taking out the trash day one now. That's my bad. I'm still you take out the trash. You're cool. Oh, um, I just want to thank you because um, as I said to you when we first sat down and you told me what you were doing, I just think um, this is just another avenue for having these great conversations. And I love the approach you're doing. And so you're definitely not only playing your part in terms of getting involved and volunteering and really modeling what that looks like, but you're doing it with this show. And so I just want to thank you for that because, again, it takes each and every one of us and Thank you to all the folks that are watching along and um, what they're doing to support this important work. So um, I'm excited that I had a chance to come and visit with you and I look forward to us continuing the conversations and I look forward to you um, doing your first volunteer gig with us. I'm gonna try to be there if I can. I'm gonna be there early picking up trash. That's what, <laughs> that's what I'm gonna be doing. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for opening up Nami, uh, NAMI's doors to us. Um, we'll have to stay in touch and we might have to have you back on again. Uh, the folks are yeah, loving and let me, so. let me just throw out as well, namicentraltx.org. So N-A-M-I centraltx.org if you want to find out more about us or look at those volunteer opportunities. Awesome. Thanks thank so you. much. Thanks, Karen. We'll talk to you later. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Man, how about that chat? How about that? I'm gonna turn the alert, bo uh, alert box uh, back on. Man, that was good. That was really good. Unbelievable. Um, she's a, just a tremendous outlet for us in this show, as you heard. I mean, she she knows it all. She's seen it all, and her story is so similar to almost everybody else's. It doesn't diminish it or, or make it better. But you guys can see that everybody involved, I mean, it's everybody's had one of those traumas or is so close to it, you might not think it. So NAMI is a great organization. If you're in the Central Texas area, get involved with them. If uh, you live somewhere else, look and see if there's an affiliate. And of course, globally, no matter where you are, anybody can get involved. And you've already seen the path that it's taken Karen to bettering her life and her daughters. Um, so it's just fantastic. I'm so glad that she's on and she has, uh, She's been connecting us with so many different people that are going to be on the program. So I can't wait uh, to see uh, who we have up next. But before we get to our next guests, our two guests um, who are going to talk to us more about getting organized, um, we got some homework to do. I asked you guys about homework last week. Last week, we um, talked about um, baby steps and, and, and what we can do. Um, so I want us to go over that homework real quick. So it is homework time. All right, so homework time. Let me put on my glasses real quick. 
so I can see what you guys sent in. If you want to be a part of homework time and have me read out uh, our homework assignments for the week, join us on our Discord channel where we have a channel dedicated to that where you can talk about your homework, what you're going to be doing, depending upon what the assignment is. And let me get a sip of kombucha. I'm just parched right now. Mm. So hot in Texas where I'm at. But our homework last week was baby steps. What can you be doing to better your mental health? Um, so I'm going to read out some of our participants and the homework that they sent in. Uh, might be giving out grades, but let's go ahead and get to it for our first homework assignment of baby steps. We had Rebecca said her baby steps were going to her GP today for talking advice, and now she is on a cognitive behavioral therapy course. Excellent job, Rebecca. Uh, Gambit said his baby steps were communicating better. Says he tends to focus uh, on others over himself and he's having issues communicating when he's having a rough time. That's a good first step to recognize that. Paul says he's going to get back to exercise and diet. Brian, you mentioned the same. You plan to walk three miles this week. I want to um, please let us know if you did. Uh, Dr. Bacon. Dr. Bacon said uh, he's going to try three new things this week. Um, thank you. Um, for, for sending that in, Dr. Bacon. That's a, that's a heck of a challenge right there. Um, so we need to know if you did the three things. What were the three things? Were you able to do even one of them? Or have you decided on what they're going to be? Please report back to the class. Jeffels. Jeffels. Uh, Jeffels uh, said this. I've been struggling the past day with what my baby steps could be. I think this week I need to admit to someone else instead of just myself that things aren't all right to force myself out there. And guess what? Mr. Jeffels reported, today I had a talk with my sister, so homework completed. Her, his sister said, depression runs in our family, make yourself a priority. That right there, folks, is how baby steps can lead you to a result. Jeffels, excellent job. Uh, Josie, now Josie, I got, I, I got something for you. Now, I, I wish I could give you a gold star, uh, but I don't know quite how to do that yet. However, we'll, we'll work on that. But Josie said... Um, a few things. One, that she needed to work on some self-harm issues, which is a massive thing to kind of undertake, especially with baby steps. And she also talked about having to deal with past traumas. And she is happy to report back. And I'm extremely proud of her. I know you guys are too. Uh, she completed her homework. And in her words, number one, I got my husband to hide all my self-harm tools and I bought fun band-aids to wear on my fingers so I don't feel my skin absent-minded. Number two, I bought a journal to write down um, what works um, in keeping my pain down to a minimum, which is excellent. And number three, and I Josie, I love this one. Anytime I enter my bathroom, I tell myself I'm beautiful and that I'm loved. And one thing I, that I like about myself, she tells herself one thing that she likes about herself. Josie, you've been paying attention to the show because rule number three on this show with the show rules is love thyself. And you have accomplished that this week. So I wish I could, I wish I could do something. Um, I, 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 gold star, gold star for Josie guys. Just amazing. Pop off in the chat. I don't know how you came, but pop off in the chat for Josie. Unbelievable job. That's how we do it. Uh, swirling sky moving on, uh, for her homework has been letting, uh, her anxiety to get the better of her. She is currently working on steps to dress. So good job. Baby Snorlax. He's also wanting to walk. Walking has been prevalent. Said he aims to lose 20 pounds. So let's all cheer him on in that endeavor. And finally, I want to end with this one guys, cause it's important. Um, girl of sandwich who's been doing great work, set up our Reddit channel for this program. Um, her homework was to take medication, uh, but said she was not able to, so she failed her homework. Um, talked about it again that uh, she failed to take her uh, medication even a few days later after that. And uh, I'm ending with this one for homework because uh, I want you guys to remember that it's okay to not get there the first time. But if you continue the reinforcement that you need to, that's a baby step, uh, step in itself. Just recognizing that you you got to keep going. Bring it up again. Bring it up again. Bring it up again. So keep going, girl of sandwich. And guess what? She did. Because guess what? She did recently post that I haven't taken my meds yet, but I did come clean to the person who's staying with me while my husband is away on business. So hopefully I can get back on track tomorrow. Boom. Progress. You told somebody. Now another baby step is taken, and now you're rolling, and now you're walking, and now you're running. And that's what I love to see you guys. That's the important stuff right there for all of us. 
to recognize is that sometimes it takes forever and you're going to be taking a lot of baby steps, but that's totally okay um, for us to do. So um, rolling along in the show, I'm, I'm so excited to bring on our next guest. I'm going to make sure that they're there. I'm not seeing them there, which is typical of both of them, um, which is fine. Um, I'm sure they'll hop on soon. I'll just, how about I give them a really good introduction and then maybe they'll come on the show. Um, so since we're talking about movements and organizations, uh, that's also for homework before I bring in my guests, which is good that they're fine uh, with them being out right now. Um, new assignment, forgot about that. New assignment for homework, for homework. We've been talking about movements and organizations, so I want each one of you to bring me a new one that we can share with everybody. Uh, it does not have to be uh, anything uh, super large. It can be local, it can be a personal favorite, uh, it can be one you've heard of but you haven't really explored. I want them all so we can share all of this stuff. And if you want to share it, join our Discord channel, um, which is listed in the links below, no matter how you're watching or listening. If you're watching live on Twitch, you're hearing all sorts of sounds go off. I really want you guys to come because it's a huge party. Our chat's amazing, but that's okay if you're not. It's okay if you prefer to listen. Um, so, um, my next two guests, who I believe are on, and I'm going to check real quick to make sure they are on right now. They are. I have them muted. So, maybe it was my fault that I, I kind of messed it up. It doesn't matter. We're learning. <laughs> hey, you pipe down now. Let me read this amazing introduction for you, okay? Amazing introduction. <clears throat> so, organizations, movements, I want all those. That's your homework for next week. Bring that to me. Uh, and my next two guests know all about that. I don't doubt that they have an endless Rolodex of organizations that everybody could put on their radar. So, these are very dear friends of mine as well, former colleagues with incredible resumes from filmmakers, writers, producers, showrunners, teachers, activists, and in my opinion, truly visionaries in the modern world. Uh, there's not a single thing these two ladies can't accomplish. So without further ado, please welcome to the program, Hannah McCarthy and Mariel Salcedo. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hannah, I still think you're, Hannah, you're still We're alive. here, we're here, we're here. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining the program. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. That's not the one I want. I want this one. That's Ooh. what we're going to talk in. So we can all be together. Um, thank you guys for joining. Um, I, I, did you guys get a chance to listen to Karen? Yes. We did, yes. And I will mm -hmm. say, uh, Karen was great. However, I don't appreciate you accusing us of not being here. Because <laughs> we were here and we were ready and we were yelling at you on mute. We uh, were. We were like, we're here. We're ready. I'm so sorry. I should have never. That was, uh, how, how dare I? How dare I you doubt know what? you, it's ladies? Okay. Yes. It's okay. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys for, for joining in. Yeah, Karen was spectacular. Um, she's just another one of those people that, that you guys are just like. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you both on this show is because I think you, you two individuals are um, people that see a problem and can't unsee it. Um, you just, that's just not in your DNA. And I think a lot of people that get involved with the organizations and volunteer and give their time, they're uh, a cut from the same cloth. They can't take their eyes off of it. They know that there's something that needs to be done. They don't know what it is, but they're going to get involved. And both of you guys, uh, throughout your careers and your lives, you've given your time to different projects, whether Hannah, it was you working a sexual assault hotline in college, Mariel, you've done uh, Forte Friday which is a tremendous thing that you do on Friday, just promoting all different types of organizations. Hey, send your money here, send it there. So you guys, uh, th this is so much in your wheelhouse um, and something that I know you're both passionate about. So um, Hannah, starting with you, what, what is that feeling of knowing that I, I got to kind of fix this problem? I see it. I need to address it. How do you kind of approach those situations? I think it's. I think it comes from a feeling, you know, it, just in my family growing up, there was always the uh, the sentiment of like the golden rule and and to to if you you know do unto others as you do have them do unto you and and if you see a problem or if you you see someone in need, um, it's just kind of your moral obligation um, to help. And so that was just something I grew up with. And uh, I am just also a, a a person who likes to be useful. 
And so when I see opportunities to um, help other people, I can't not do it. Um, sometimes to my own detriment, because I'll be fixated on uh, being helpful and, and will be, you know, uh, unable to think about anything else other than being able to help and fix a problem that I see. Um, so, yeah. And Mayoral, I know you're the same way. I kind of want to, uh, I don't know if this is okay to share, but I know that there's a place that you would used to go to every week on your own spare time that nobody even really knew about um, to just give your efforts. Cause that's the type of person that you are, especially even starting Forte Friday. Uh, oh, when I visited hell once a week, I still go there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to, I used to volunteer at a, um, at an elementary school, uh, once a week. I have obviously did, have not done that since COVID started and whatnot, but, um, one of my best friends is a social worker at, uh, an elementary school here in Austin. And, um, she was basically like, you know, we have a lot of younger kids who are struggling, especially with the Trump rhetoric, with the immigration rhetoric, and also just these like these kids who uh, may be coming from these like Spanish speaking countries and don't have like anything but their parents. And they like struggle getting along with their teachers and their peers and stuff. And she was basically like, you know, we're we're looking for uh, volunteers who speak spanish who can come and basically like hang out with these kids like once a week and so that's what i would do i'd go and literally just like an hour out of my day um every week just go and like play legos or like do some coloring books or something i never really talked about it just because i don't know like it felt weird to be like hanging out with kids once a week and it was also like <laughs> kind of put me out of my comfort zone um because it wasn't like like i love kids but i have a hard time talking to kids who aren't related to me <laughs> So it was definitely uh, a bit hard for me. But I do want to talk about something um, very, very specific that I actually have never spoken about uh, before this point. But basically, whenever um, after George Floyd was murdered and um, I started doing a bunch of fundraising, there was one day in particular that uh, my fiance, Hannah, and I, uh, we decided we were actually going to go out to protest in Austin like we didn't tell any I mean we told the people that we love the most which was two of you guys <laughs> <laughs> um and I remember I like turned my location on because you know it's not a very safe thing to do um and especially at that time like protesters were being arrested and all sorts of things and so I was like wanted to keep the donations going and I remember specifically that day I was uh raising donations for the Loveland Foundation um, Rachel Cargill's Loveland Foundation and I texted Hannah and I said Hannah can you please pretend to be me on Twitter <laughs> and keep this donation drive going because I'm going to go protest and who knows I might get arrested <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and can you keep that going for me and so there was one full day that I basically was not on the internet at all and Hannah was like running my account and I don't think I've ever thanked you for that. So thank you for doing that. Um, There's no thanks needed for that. It was an honor. But, but that was like one of the best days. I think we raised over like $30,000 on, yeah. on that day alone. Um, and I think it just goes to show you that like a lot of times it may seem like one person's doing something, but there's like a whole team of, of people. Um, Hannah actually picked us up from a protest one day. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yep. you know, it, it was it was great. And it's just really nice to be able to like do things like that but also have the support from from people you love and to um, not only help you keep that going but like doing it themselves and i kind of think so. that that kind of goes into my next question about and i think i already know the answer but i think it's important for people to hear is that when you do get involved like that your circle grows whether you want mm -hmm. to want it to or not and with that comes more i mean it comes more of humans which can always be troublesome but it comes with a lot more care and a lot more love and for you guys, could you imagine your lives any other way without getting um, involved in organizations? And how has that affected your mental health in itself? Because I think that's, in a, in, a, in a sense, really what we're trying to figure out here on our show is those of us who have afflictions or know somebody that does, how can getting involved really benefit our mental health? Does it for you guys? Uh, yes and no. I mean, sometimes it can be really hard. And like, I remember there was times where, especially during this past summer or two summers ago, a year ago, God, um, I like 
had a complete mental breakdown. <laughs> I laid on the couch and Hannah put both of our weighted blankets. So I had like 40 pounds just on me and I just like lay there because I was just like, uh, God, it never ends. Like mm -hmm. the bad stuff never ends. And so then the good people have to keep trying and it just feels like this like it's like this never ending circle of like bad shit constantly happening and good people having to rise up to fight it. Mm -hmm. And it can be it can feel like really dark at some points where you're just like what is it all for like i'm helping you know people are are being helped but like is it just going to continue to be this bad and who knows <laughs> sometimes i think it can lead you um down like a dark path but i don't think that means like i don't know i think i like i hit had points where i just had to like push through it and i was very lucky that i did have the support of a lot of friends um but also, like, my job was very supportive and, like, I got notes from people just saying, like, hey, like, you know, you're doing a great thing right now. Like, don't worry about doing, like, your actual work because we see that you're, like, working. Um, but it can be super consuming, so you do have to, like, take care of yourself during it. And I can't even imagine, like, you know, the people who are actually on the front lines of things and there's people who are constantly, like, out on the streets with with um unhoused folks and like you know making sure they're being taken care of and it's it's a lot it's a lot to uh uh to take on mm -hmm. yeah there's a term i heard um i actually think it was through my fostering of animals but i think it applies to um a lot of different efforts like what we're talking about um which is compassion fatigue where if you're in a uh role where you're working in any capacity that demands a lot of your human emotions you know empathy compassion um generally extending yourself emotionally to other people or or causes um it can be very very emotionally taxing on you and so i think that's where it's so important to be able to take care of yourself and know when you need to take a pause and focus on your own well-being or ask for help. Like, I, I want to do this, but I know if I try to do both of these things, that's going to be too much for me. So I need to ask a friend um, for their help, for their support, so that I can do the things that I need to do to take care of myself. Um, and I think that that is hard to manage but really important and i think the more you do any kind of outreach work or um just so work on yourself or self-care i think that keeping that in mind that it is something that is um you know an emotional mental uh you know burdens too strong of a word but it is something you're going to be carrying and um you got to put put it down sometimes and rest um or ask somebody to help you carry that weight um, and so knowing how and when to identify if you're feeling that way, um, what things you can do that will help you kind of balance that out is really important because it is it's a lot to take on for sure. So with that, Hannah, you know, Mary, you kind of told us a little bit about you use an actual weighted blanket to deal with the weight of it all. But I think one of the things, and uh, this is something we address in our first episode, is we are getting really good at identifying trauma and like targeting mm -hmm. the affliction, right? Like we're naming it, we're being with it, being present with it. But I think folks are really interested too, Hannah, with everything starting with you, uh, what you just said. Um, mm -hmm having that compassion fatigue and knowing I got to take the time and I have to do me, what are some of the things that you do? I mean, what are the, when you have that anxiety that gets ramped up or mm -hmm. whatever you're dealing with, what are some specific things that you do to kind of, you know, make things okay? So for me, and I, we briefly touched on, and I've talked to both of you about about this, but I, on top of like, you know, the stuff that I, I do in terms of, uh, work I do in my in my time as volunteering or in outreach stuff. Um, I'm someone who struggles with I since I was in a teenager, I've I was diagnosed with um, OCD and generalized anxiety disorder. And so for a real a really long time, I've had to kind of learn, uh, you know, coping mechanisms or things that I can do that will help me deal with the way my stress or my anxiety or my OCD are manifesting. Um, and so a lot of that is uh, I over time have found, you know, it depends on the my mood, the way that the anxiety or the intrusive thoughts are hitting me. Um, sometimes I just need to be distracted by something else, something that is um, 
sort of mindless but therapeutic like sometimes if i'm really anxious it's like i'm gonna do a weird i'm gonna tear apart my house and and reorganize things and clean things even though it's it's not even that productive at a certain point because i'm just shuffling the places of my clutter um but i think it's also you know you and i tyler have talked a lot about um for me, it's been exercise too. Like that was something I hate running. I think of that Ann Perkins quote from Parks and Rec where she's like, I know it's good for you, but God, at what cost? <laughs> um, and, but it's true. Like finding a, a means of exercise that I liked because I was like, I didn't like running. Um, but I always played team sports growing up. And I, I found that if I was in classes where someone could tell me what to do, just the the chemical i know so much of what i deal with is chemical and i remember you guys talking a lot in your in the first episode about being able to pinpoint that and then going okay how do i how do i deal with this and and part of it for me was that being able to say okay i know that this thing i'm dealing with is chemical um or it's the result of this really stressful situation i'm going through or something that's happening in my life how do i channel that in my case anxiety or intrusive thoughts how do i kind of refocus my brain and I found that if I was in a class exercising, um, having someone tell me what to do, didn't have to be, you know, doing anything super crazy, but just doing something else, my brain would be focused on that for the hour that I was doing that. And the the chemical differences I was experiencing when I was doing that were better. And so, and sometimes it's just watching something that I've watched a hundred times. The good thing about having a very obsessive mind is I'm like, I'll just put on Paddington again and just watch that. <laughs> and feel better immediately. Um, but yeah, I think it's different for everybody. I think it's finding the things that, depending on what you're looking to to cope with, you know, um, and talking to people. That was something that was really hard for me for a really long time, was being able to um, vocalize what I was going through and finding people like you, like Mariel, um, you know, people in my life who I really trusted and who I knew would understand or would listen to this is just how I'm feeling or people who wouldn't get judgmental if I was like I would love to see you but I can't I can't go out today I I it's not because I don't love you it's not because I don't want to hang out with you I'm just having a bad brain day and I can't do it um or like can we just stay in can we can you come over and play board games instead I don't want to be somewhere with lots of people today and having people who understood that and were accepting of that I think is is so helpful um but yeah absolutely um I think it's really important to one thing you said when it comes to we get a little bit overwhelmed when we hear something mm -hmm. like, well, I know I need to exercise. Oh, my God. What does that mean? Like lift weights? Yeah. Do I got to go ham? Mm -hmm. No, literally going back to our first episode, baby steps. I've mm -hmm. had so many people. We heard it in homework just now. Walking. Guys, walking yes. is just one of the best things you can do. I walk more than I run. I really don't even run anymore. I, I'd love to go to a Me walk too. around the park. Just sit that is more beneficial to my mental health than most of the things I do. And I know for you, Mariel, um, th there's certain things that you do. And I know you kind of know me, like we've had this conversation before where people and Hannah, this goes back to what you're saying about um, needing to have those boundaries. People would know me as a flake when I really couldn't communicate like, look, I mentally just cannot be there yeah. today. Um, and so people sometimes don't understand that, but I found solace with Mariel. She, she understands that Hannah, you do too. Mm -hmm. Um, and Mariel for you, I mean, what is it, um, that, that you kind of look to as well when you need that reset button? Uh, Xanax. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that, uh, Talk to your doctors, serious, guys. yes, yep. uh, get prescriptions. Don't uh, go about it uh, dumb and illegally, but, um, truly like I was someone who was very against ever being on, ever being medicated um i was kind of in the belief of like ah oh, it's just all in my head i should get over it um and so i started going to therapy and even in the therapy uh i realized i was like it's just not enough like i need i need like you know hannah was kind of saying it's like a chemical thing that's wrong with me and i can't function this way um and so i got on zoloft and that was great i've been on zoloft for god like at least three years now i'm look, trying to look at my calendar i have no <laughs> idea when i started it but um i got a zoloft prescription and then i also got a xanax prescription for like in case of emergencies type of thing um and in like the three years let's just say three years that i've had my prescriptions um i've only refilled my xanax twice 
and each time was like 10 pills. So I can tell you in, in, you know, in three years, I've used it less than 10 times basically. Um, but for me, it's just, it's nice to have, um, especially when I'm flying, I used to be a great flyer on now for the last few years, I've developed like crazy flight anxiety. Um, so it's nice to have for those situations. Um, and then I think sometimes like for me, I do feel like I have certain coping mechanisms. Um, uh, Hannah and I do a lot of, uh, like, I don't know, I, I, I'll call it weight therapy because I don't know what else to call it. But, like, we'll literally just be like, I just need you to lay on me. And I just need to mm-hmm. feel, like, grounded. I need to feel something heavy on me. Um, I also and, use a weighted blanket. And it's, like, yeah. so and it's important. great. It's, I love it. It's great to feel like you're kind of just being, like, compressed for a second. Um, we do a lot of that. We'll do a little bit of meditation. We'll, like, do some breathing exercises. But sometimes I think it's okay to admit, like, you know what, none of that's going to work right now. Like, I can't come down from where I am right now without literally taking something. And so, um, yeah, Xanax has been wonderful for me. I use it pretty sparingly. Like, I don't really use it too often, but it is nice to have, especially when I do feel like I'm in, like, this position that I just, like, cannot get out of. Um, And also just distractions, like Hannah was talking about. One of my favorite distractions is I have these... um, it's they're not like paint by numbers, but it's like sticker by sticker numbers. By numbers. Yeah, yes, I absolutely love those. Um, That's right, like I'm, meticulous, yes. tasks yes. where you can be like meticulous, meticulous tasks where you focused on something. Yes. Yeah, those are great for me. Um, I tend to find that like my most anxious mind exists uh, at night. Uh, especially, sorry, I just realized it's like getting really dark in here. Um, <laughs> You're okay. Your voice is coming through clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, but especially like my anxiety always comes in at night at, at the worst times. Like as I'm going to bed, I'm just like, oh God, like what if a plane crashes on my house in like 10 seconds? Like what would I do? Um, and so I'm trying to work through that and trying to work through, um, you know, not I think it's just because my brain isn't active like it's Mm. it's it's at its least active at night and so and also you're oh go ahead oh no no you go ahead I was gonna say also I I think sometimes it's because we push off stuff during the day and so we just kind of just go I'm gonna compartmentalize throughout the entire day and then you push it off push it off push it off and then as soon as you hit the pillow you're like ah my brain is unoccupied with tasks now's the time to think about everything horrible that I don't want to think about (laughs) exactly yeah exactly and it's and it's tough so like you know i like i always use xanax kind of as a last resort if i can't get through all these other things um a lot of times uh it's literally just like mind-numbing tiktoks and i just like turn on tiktoks and like try to distract distract my brain for a little bit enough for me to be like okay like i'm tired enough that i can close my eyes and go to sleep so Mm -hmm. uh yeah drugs uh legal drugs (laughs) that you get from a doctor (laughs) Yes, doctor um, prescribed. And I know weighted blanket, I think, or just like feeling weight. Um, Box breathing is another thing you made me think of when you were talking oh, about yeah. that. If I'm having like a really panicky, not full on panic attack, but I'm getting, it can tell my anxiety is getting peaked. I'll do box breathing um, until I can feel my heart rate lowering and it helps. Um, at least yeah. if you catch it, like, you know, when you're starting to get a little bit anxious, I've found that I really appreciate doing that too yeah for sure i I think you guys are nailing something that a lot of our audience members need to hear if they if they don't know it already i'm sure a lot Mm -hmm. of them do but all the things you guys are talking about are really going back to like basics and like the human Mm -hmm. being level like i need touch i need comfort Mm -hmm. i need these small activities i I don't need the sensory overload and i think you guys Mm -hmm. nailed on a bunch of different levels of ways to do that because that's all it is right it's going back Mm -hmm. to like being a kid where I have nothing to worry yeah. about. Um, and Hannah, when you were talking about, uh, you know, everything hits you at night, everybody's sitting in their car right now listening to this, or if they're watching at home, like, damn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's literally yeah. all of us. Uh, yeah. that, and unfortunately, that's the way that so many of us operate is we do let that kind of just, I know for myself, oh, the moment I hit the sheets, I'm like, what if 9-11 mm-hmm. happens again? What am I going <laughs> to do? And I, and in my oh mind, my and, and I don't mean to make it comedic no, right I there, know. but it, it literally, like, I think of the, like, kind of like you guys are talking about. You think of worst, worst case thing. scenarios. No, exactly. Yeah. We all think of the yeah. worst thing that could possibly happen again. And that's a legit scenario that I told you. I literally mm-hmm. thought about that one night and I could not sleep. 
which is a horrible thing to think about. Oh no! Um, but it happens to all of us. Um, but I think all the guy, all the things you guys talked about, where Mary, all the balance with medication and then doing the other activities as well, is very important for other people to hear about that balance. Um, mm -hmm. And knowing that you got to take a break sometimes. And even when you guys are doing the work of getting involved and helping other people's lives, it's a good reminder, too, that if you do join an organization because mm -hmm. of something you heard during the show earlier on and you want to get involved, to have that other piece, too. So I'm so glad that both of you guys touched on that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and go ahead, Hannah. I was going to say, someone asked because I didn't actually say it, box breathing. What is it? Yeah, uh, let me ask that for our audio yes. listeners. Hannah, what is box breathing? Box breathing. It is a technique for uh, s sort of calming your fight or flight, you know, uh, nervous response reaction to stress. Um, I want to say like the Marines came up with it or something. That seems like what it is. Um, but all it is is that you will, uh, it's basically breathing in and, and holding in spots of four. So you can visualize, and I find it helps to visualize as well. You will um, breathe in for four, so you'll inhale for four beats, hold for four beats, release for four beats, hold for four beats, and then just repeat that cycle of inhaling, holding, releasing, holding, inhaling, holding. You get the idea. So Hannah, um, I, think, I think we gotta do something now. Um, it's it's was going to be a goal of mine on this show anyways to have instructional videos uh, we might have to have you come back to kind of demonstrate that for us I think yeah be very beneficial i um, love it I, I was just practicing it. it just right there like one two three four <sighs> one Two, yeah, three, and that feels freaking good. It's Guys, great, it and especially good. if you're a visual person, which I am. Like, Same. I literally picture like dots ticking as I'm going, and it's just very calming. And in from a again a biological chemical standpoint, regulating your breathing and your intake and your exhaling slows the sometimes the reaction. You know, it helps slow your heart rate. It helps physically calm you down. Um, and if you're someone like me who deals with intrusive thoughts or obsessive, you know, kind of thought cycles where I can get in a cognitive loop, breaking that by having something very focused, but also not, um, you know, you're not trying to think through thoughts. You're just thinking in numbers or circles or bleeps, uh, blips or whatever is best for you. Um, I find it really helpful. It's worth that, a try. I think that's fascinating. We got we have to get you on because I, I hate the ticking of the <laughs> clock, but I like a dot. I'm sure a lot of our yeah. listeners do as well. So we might just have uh, have to have you uh, come yeah. show us. And it's so funny, guys. Again, hearing it from Mariel and Hannah, we're talking about the basics. And I'm not saying I'm an expert because I try and re reinforce this in my brain of walk, breathe, <laughs> <with> my <laughs> self comfort. And that's something that we all know we can do, but we forget to connect with that and it really affects our mental health so thank you guys for coming on to like kind of remind us that we got to do the basics thank you for sharing uh why you guys get involved and and the right way to get involved mario i thought it was very good to you know and i appreciate you sharing uh kind of your struggles that you've been going through and how you manage them uh, i think a lot of people are going to find that helpful um before i get you guys out of here i mean you guys are in the know uh y'all know words like yeet and uh <laughs> what <laughs> what this means oh, where i thought that was going oh, no yeah i know y'all got y'all guys are you know what's in vogue um so before i get you out of here do you guys have any organizations movements at the moment that you could tell mm. folks about that you think they should uh go uh research and check out well i think you did we already had a great you know encouragement for um nami i think that that's incredible um i you know you mentioned at the at the top my background was um when i was in college for three years i worked on a sexual assault hotline um and so a lot of the work i did there i was trained in crisis response training that was really i think powerful for me individually for how i deal with um helping myself and others um, but if you have, uh, you know, an organization in your area, certainly in Austin, they're safe, um, is one in Austin that is really great. Um, but if you can volunteer with organizations like that, um, they're always really wonderful. And that's just a, a personal close to my heart, um, type of thing. But NAMI is amazing. Like you said, I loved listening to you and Karen talk. 
Um, Mariel's got the Rolodex. I just do whatever Mariel tells me to do. That's my my I, guiding principle in life. I don't have enough on oh, man. my sheet, Mariel. So we'll just you'll have to send <laughs> me all the links. Um, yes. But yeah, uh, get the people. Well, right now, I, I think in Austin, a big issue that's been going on lately is just uh, there's been a lot of sweeps on unhoused people um who have nowhere to go and are getting arrested and uh you know it's just not great things happening so mm. uh i mean but that's all over the country um so i would say you know depending on where you're at uh you know see if you can find an organization that's doing some good for um for unhoused people here in austin we have uh there's the little petal alliance um there's uh gosh i'm blanking on the other names but there's also free fridges that i um that are great to to drop stuff off at if you know mm -hmm. find out if there's a free fridge in your area you can um obviously central take texas food, food bank yeah. yeah yeah there's um there's a, there's like a few free fridges here in austin um there's a few downtown there's a few down south um but basically that they are what they say they are they're basically just a fridge usually set up at someone's house or a place of business where you can um, pick up and drop off food. You can pick up and drop off um, toiletries, you know, every so often. There's one at one of our favorite restaurants here in Austin called Nixta. Mm. And so whenever Hannah and I go and eat there, we always try and make sure to go buy like H-E-B and, you know, get some like easy, ready to make meals uh, to drop off there. And then also some like tampons and like socks and stuff like that, that you would think, um, uh, you would really like think to give uh but uh i think it's important to know that we're all much closer to homelessness than we are to being jeff bezos so that is the truth uh, take care of each other um you know help people where you can and be good to each other you know yeah. like, that's all it takes just just be good to each other and love one another i don't know that's all i got well, thank you both. I think uh, I think everybody has a lot to work with. There's a ton of information that you guys just gave out that people might not have thought of, different perspectives. And that's what I love about you guys. Uh, you, you have been through the ringer and have so many past experiences that can help others and you continue to do so. Um, I couldn't be prouder to have you guys as my friends. And I know everybody, I speak for everybody on this show who's listening, watching. Thank you both for coming on. Absolutely amazing. Your love. I don't have... I don't have an applause applause uh, sound effect yet. <laughs> we'll just... I'm working on a, a shoestring budget here, guys. Ain't a lot I of I love cash. it. You're <laughs> doing amazing work. And just to shower that that love and praise back on you, Tyler, we're grateful to be here. I will speak with Mariel, not for Mariel, um, in saying that we are so grateful for you and, and everything you're doing. You've always been a very inspiring person. And, and clearly this is just, yeah, you know, another wonderful thing you're doing. And I think to Mariel's point, community is such an important part of this and you're already building one here for so many people to find people they can share their experiences with and learn and grow and um you're doing amazing work and we're grateful to know you thank you Absolutely. stop it don't Absolutely. make me cry get out of here <laughs> get get before i start Go and crying get all right i love you thank guys thank you for having uh, us thank you you are more than welcome to pop back on any time hannah i'm going to talk to you about those breathing I'll, exercises i'll do it our, i'm our ready would love that so okay. all right i'll see you ladies later thank you again so much bye tyler okay. see ya man tremendous i th think i just froze real quick on my obs I, I'm not sure. Sorry about that, guys. Just trying to figure out some stuff right here. I don't know if the chat can still see me. Um, having just a few technical issues. Oh, I think we're back now. Okay, there we go. Okay. Sometimes it freezes, you know. My computer was overwhelmed that Hannah and Mariel left. So I was like, wait, what? Why are they leaving? We should just have them on forever. Um Thank you to, again to both of those ladies uh, for joining and to Karen for joining today. I thought this was an excellent episode. Uh, um, thank you, everybody, for homework. And, man, I think we're starting to get something going on here. I'm so glad if you're watching, listening, wherever you are, uh, for tuning in today and being a part of this community because you're part of it. If you're listening, you're part of it. So welcome. We love you. Deal with it. Um, 
Today was really special to have those folks on, and I'm so excited for our continued episodes as we begin to touch on all different facets of mental health. You know, these first couple episodes are really about building that foundation for how do I start? How do I get involved? How do I start with the basics? Um, And so we're making good progress on this show. I'm very proud of you guys and everybody who's joining in and being a part of the conversation. We want you to be a part of the conversation. I'll let you know that uh, if you watch us live on Twitch, that I do a post show at the end of every show where you guys can watch me live. We kind of discuss the episode that we just had and then talk about, tease a little about next week's episode. Um, So thank you again to Karen Reynas for being on the program, for Hannah McCarthy, uh, and Mariel Salcedo for joining us as well. Thank you to Nami for opening up your doors. And before I get out of here, guys, I thought it'd be, you know, we'll end with a quote every once in a while, but this is a good one uh, to remind you guys if we're thinking about how do I get involved and how would that benefit myself? Take it from Gandhi. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And we all know that to be very, very true. All right, folks. I'm going to get out of here. I got to go to some uh, volunteer work, but I expect to see all of you guys next week and we can talk about how we are doing today. See you folks.